going into those houses without a warrant. That's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. It's a violation of everybody's rights. Mama, please, watch everything. Bad people don't go out and destroy the Constitution. Well-intentioned, good people go out and destroy the Constitution. Major... are certainly invasions of people's privacy but in every case the police here in Oakland California have gotten a search warrant that makes it legal to enter the house there's a search warrant signed today by Judge Instrosa he told us to come up here and search your residence so why don't you go ahead and get up last year the Oakland Vice Squad seized more than seven million dollars worth of drugs mostly cocaine by searching houses like these. This is ridiculous. That's not ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Tell me the judge. search warrant. So the judge, the judge signs it, you know. Wait a minute, somebody can That's an order by the judge to come up here. Hey, y'all, man. Uh, hi. Oh, That's my problem. We got, a, we got a cleanup crew that comes in behind us. No, I'm serious. Yeah. I, do you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know y'all, but... Everett Dreminger has fought drugs in Oakland for 14 years. He helped put away one of the biggest heroin dealers in the West but he took seven long years of investigation to produce the warrant that nailed him. Yeah, the uh, search warrants uh, probably the greatest tool a police officer has. Uh, I've, I've written search warrants as long as 23, 24 page affidavit, uh, and you have to be up on the laws all the time when you're, when you're working uh, search warrants. You have to know what you're writing in there. To obtain a warrant from a judge, narcotics officers need more than suspicion and the instincts that come from years of experience. They have to gather reliable, specific information. How reliable is the informant on this thing? Informant's real good. I've, I've done uh, at least five to six other search warrants behind the informants. Here's the paper I typed up. In order to search a suspect's home and seize evidence legally, vice cops have to become experts on the rules of search and seizure. The basic rules have always been the same. Um, you need probable cause and you need a warrant. That's in the Constitution. That's in the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment protects everybody's right to privacy, our right to be secure in our homes and our persons. I want everybody to have these rights, and I want them to know their rights. And I want those rights to be there. I'm a public defender. This office, the Alameda County Public Defender's Office, was founded in 1927. There were two public defenders then. There's about 110, 120 now. The um, district attorney of Alameda County at the time was Earl Warren. Um, he was the chief justice at the time of the decision in Gideon versus Wainwright, which guaranteed that if a person's... And one of the cases he had was a case where the, uh, the police searched John Hancock's uh, desk in his office without a warrant and he attacked that in the criminal case against Hancock at the time. Of course, the uh, controlled substance in question was tea. The Fourth Amendment, which protects the people from unreasonable search and seizure, came directly from the colonists' first-hand experience under British rule. The amendment sets out specific guidelines for obtaining a search warrant from a judge. Hello, Your Honor. I have a search, uh, search warrant I would like to have you review, okay. possibly okay. sign, sir. Apologize for coming unannounced. Oh, no, that's all right. You have to catch whoever is available. Yes, sir. Let's see uh, what you have. Yes, sir. The Constitution requires that the judge look very closely at the evidence presented to support a warrant. The police must state what they're looking for, the specific place they want to enter, and the particular people they want to search. They must also prove they have a good reason, called probable cause, to believe that the person or place to be searched is involved in a crime. You know, Your Honor, I was considering uh, putting a piece of evidence in the... Well, no, no. <laughs> Wait a minute, officer. 
the affidavit either stands or falls on what you have in here. We'll discuss whatever you have in mind later, yes, but let's sir. see if it's adequate to support the, uh, the search warrant. Yes, sir. In this case, the officer made an undercover purchase of crack himself and had the police lab confirm that the material was, in fact, rock cocaine. Your typical hand-to-hand -hand sale? Yes, Your Honor. If the judge believes there is a probable cause, he'll sign the warrant, giving the police the authority to search the house. All right. You saw me swear that all the statements contained in the affidavit are true, so I hope you got it. I do. The police prepare these papers carefully because if the warrant isn't correct, the search may be illegal, and any evidence seized will be thrown out at the trial. This wasn't always the case. Back in 1957, police in Cleveland, Ohio, broke into the home of this woman, Dolry Mapp, in search of a bombing suspect. Her arrest and the legal battle that followed dramatically altered the criminal justice system. It was not an unusual day. It was a day that I was preparing to go do some chores before going to my metaphysical class. I was a student of metaphysics at the time, and I was also taking art sketching, hoping that one day I'd become a dress designer. About one o'clock, when I was drying my hair, I heard the crashing of glass, and I was frightened. I rushed downstairs, and there were a dozen men in my house, inside the house already, waving a piece of paper, yelling to me that they had a search warrant, claiming it was a search warrant. They ransacked her house while looking for the bombing suspect. A police officer happened upon some nude sketches Map had made and several sex books. The rest of the men gathered round to see. And they forgot about me. And their faces were getting red. And I don't know, maybe they were aroused, I don't know. But it wasn't funny to me, it was funny to them, okay? The police seized Map's sketches and books. She was eventually charged with possession of obscene materials. But at her trial, the judge heard that there was no warrant issued for the search of her home. And he said, even though the evidence were illegally seized, they're permissible in my court. And that's what they convicted me on. Illegally seized evidence that was permitted in the judge's court. And that's what I fought through the Ohio courts all the way to Washington, the United States Supreme Court. In 1961, four years after her arrest, Mapp's case was argued before the Supreme Court. At issue was whether a state could use evidence obtained by violating her Fourth Amendment rights. The day that my case was heard was a very, very important day in my life. But the most important moment was when I entered that courtroom. It was so still, and in the entire courtroom, there was just three people, and here's these nine judges. I never will forget this little judge that I found out later was named Felix Frankfurter. He said, where is this woman? And I'm sitting back there in court, you know, and I, oh, I got such a thrill. He said, where is this woman? I want to say, here I am, but I didn't. The justices were debating the exclusionary rule. This deterred police misconduct by excluding illegally seized evidence from federal trials. But MAPS was a state trial. They kept bringing the books back and they kept talking about legal search and seizure. I didn't realize at the time how important the case was. To me, it only meant one thing, not having to serve seven years. I really can't describe how I felt because I was, I'd sit there waiting for that phone to ring because I wanted to find out the decision. When the phone ring, I would jump, hello, 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 have a collect call, yes, 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 yes. For 12 Mondays, I went through this agony, frustration. Every Monday, I went through the same thing. But that 13th Monday, that lucky 13th, was the day of my salvation, the day that the Supreme Court watched this conviction down the drain. I was ecstatic. The court's decision cleared Dahl Remap. It also extended the exclusionary rule to all state trials, protecting everyone's Fourth Amendment rights. Now, the exclusionary rule enforces this law. Without it, without the exclusionary rule, it's, uh, it's no more of a law than the Boy Scout law. A Boy Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Fine. How do you make a Boy Scout do that, if that's the law? There is no way to do it. Uh, the Fourth Amendment without any enforcement is simply something like the Boy Scout law do it but if you don't 
nothing's going to happen. The police are not Boy Scouts. Before the Fourth Amendment was actually enforced, the police had little incentive to change their methods. Well, I remember in New York, just before MAP, uh, was when the police were just stopping everybody on the street and searching them at random. Uh, they used to go into people's houses just for the hell of it without a search warrant and just search it to see if they could turn something up. Meanwhile, there was a law, the Fourth Amendment said, don't do that. In 1960, the year before MAP, the New York City police had not bothered to ask for a single search warrant. One year later, after the exclusionary rule applied to them, they had to obtain 800. Since 1961, the search and seizure rules apply to police everywhere. Police! Search warrant! Please, search warrant, open the door! Please! There you go. Oh, great. How you doing? Put your hands up against the wall right here. Hands up against the wall. Police! The violence was too much for these Oakland residents. Thousands of them defied the drug dealers and demanded action. What we've done is unified as community, and we've point, pointed to the fact that there are positive residents, positive citizens, people who, are, uh, who don't tolerate or condone or feel imprisoned by uh, this satanic uh, drug trade that's going on. We're marching for righteousness because we want everybody in the community to know, those that are scared, those that are frightened, that there are people out here to help them. We want to help them. You want to see your children live in a society where they don't have to be plagued by the distributors, the pushers of drugs of all kinds. You have demonstrated today by your presence here how much you care about your city. No one knows better how dangerous it is here than the residents who call the police for help against the drug dealers in their neighborhoods. Of course, if the police could see inside every house, they'd find more weapons and they'd find more drugs. But searching everyone's house is going to invade the privacy of a great many innocent people. In many cases, the people who are calling the police for help. How can government control crime effectively when your individual constitutional rights limit what the police and for that matter the courts can do. Would you be willing to give up some of your rights so that the police could fight crime more effectively? That's the essential question. How do we balance the need for public safety and the need for individual liberty? The Oakland police had to create a new special unit to try to achieve the balance, an anti-drug force designed to restore public safety without violating individual liberties. Uh, the phone was ringing off the hook, hundreds of people calling in, upset, kids couldn't walk to the store, uh, they were displaced from playgrounds, street corners, you name it. They had, the thugs had pretty much taken over a lot of public places. Associated with that was a lot of violence. A lot of drive-by shootings and things of that sort. A lot of, a lot of competition out there, which was frequently resolved by gunfire. Uh, the way we typically dealt with drugs wasn't workable. Getting a warrant may take too much time. So the Oakland police created a new special duty unit, SDU-2. Unlike Vice, they work without warrants. The squad waits around the corner as an undercover officer, seen here on the left, buys narcotics with marked money. The SDU-2 thing works especially well because the cop operates with certain knowledge that, you know, a cop made, made the buy from a known dealer and immediately thereafter other cops swooped in on the corner and arrested a guy with marked money and possibly still with some dope on him. It's quick, it's efficient, it's effective. We don't need a warrant, uh, we don't have to Mirandize him uh, because the simple fact that we don't need his confession. We don't need an admission. We've got the best possible evidence. Eyewitness testimony from an officer and probably some marked money that was exchanged during the, during the sale of drugs. This task force is coordinated in the field by Officer Joe Seal. His face has become too familiar on the streets to make buys anymore. Today, Patty Malera will be acting as the buy officer. In a few hours, she will be cruising Oakland's drug hotspots. She'll make the undercover buys 
And then radio this man, Joe Carranza, who along with his partner, Kevin Rogers, and the rest of the team will swoop down on the unsuspecting dealer. These highly motivated volunteers were handpicked by the team's leader, Sergeant Frank Muschietti. They call in and they say, look, we got these idiots standing on our streets, they're dealing dope, they're trashing our neighborhood, they're making life miserable for us, can you help? And next thing they know is they got the blue and gold raid jackets running through their backyards and kicking ass, okay? They know that they're getting service. They know that the police is responding. Plus, the dopers know, the dope dealers know, hey, this area is hot. We deal in this area, we run the risk of running into task force. This task force now arrests more than 2,000 people a year, four times as many as the vice squad. In a town where many cry for more police protection, they have made an impact. You guys looking out the window this time? Quiet, man. Huh? Yeah? You watch us come in? You telling me that you didn't know that they're selling cocaine out of this place? Standing in your back door here, dealing it over the back fence? You want me to believe that? There is one flushing and stuff back there. What's his name? What's your name, man? Huh? Reginald Jelks, man. Sounds like Reginald Jelks. I want to flush your name, man. What are you doing, just using the bathroom? Uh, you had to be using the bathroom when the police kicked the door. You're on the wall, Reginald? Yeah. I ain't doing that, man. Just a new job. Just a new job. For what? Just for being secure in the house? That don't make no sense. Have a seat. This man is going to jail. But he won't be formally charged with a crime unless the arresting officer's report passes the test. The first check is made by this man. Okay, we've got Reginald Yelks, uh, actually it's Yelks, Y-E-L-K-S. No, it's J-E-L-K-S. Yeah. Police came in the bathroom and got me out of the bathroom. He didn't find, I don't have no money. I have no dough by him. The lady said who, uh, who was supposed to be the buyer. Don't describe one person and a hand. The report reflects that a hand reached over a fence and delivered the dope to the uh, juvenile who sold it to the cop. Unless we're going to have a hand comparison in court, there's no way we're going to prove that was his hand. They find him in the apartment, and it would, the report would sort of reflect that possibly he's there by himself. So that's certainly reasonable cause to believe that he's involved in the crime, in as much as they know that the person who committed the crime came out of that apartment. So we've certainly got enough to arrest him. Not everyone who's arrested is formally charged with a crime. The DA's going to love to see this. Sergeant Jim Kimsey weeds out the weaker cases and takes the rest to the district attorney's office, where he will try to convince D.A. Aaron Payne to prosecute them. Good morning, Mr. Payne. How are you, sir? I was better, but I'm over it. Well, here we are. Okay, we've got Reginald Yelks here. That's one of those, uh, the hand did it. We can't necessarily prove he did it. I think that's what you're going to tell me. The uh, dope, huh? We got the report on that? Okay, a juvenile was a person, sold the cocaine to the police. Uh, then uh, he gets the dope from a hand over the fence. That's what the report reflects, is we have a hand that does it. The, the hand then goes inside the apartment. So it's like that commercial, the hand. Right? Yeah, if we could chop off the hand and maybe have a hand line up. <laughs> the camera, uh, sure. To it, you know. Okay. This one goes in the circular. Nothing changes. A few weeks after Jelks was released, the SDU-2 task force returned to the same apartment, chasing yet another suspected cocaine dealer. Despite their very best efforts, the police feel unable to stem the tide in their war against cocaine. It's just wrecking this generation. Cocaine is, you know, I've been in the business uh, one way or another now since about 1965, working in prison, working as a probation officer, working as a DA. And cocaine, to me, uh, is worse than heroin. I'm seeing it worse than heroin. Cocaine and PCP are the worst, worst drugs around right now. 
one of the things I think that we, we do have to be aware of and as a district attorney in working with this particular unit is to make sure that at least they know what the law is. As we said before, these guys are working right on the cutting edge of what is permissible and what is precluded under modern court's interpretation of what is allowed by the Fourth Amendment. What are they going to do, flush them down the toilet? That's the, sure. The, wouldn't that be enough right there to know that the stuff is inside the house, the money is going in that house to give you enough reason Absolutely. to go in there? Absolutely. You know it's in there. Why can't you come back and write a search warrant? That's what the defense is going to say. You know, it's we might as well fold our tents and, you know, go into the night there if we can't go arrest a felony suspect. And I can't believe that the state of California is going to allow What are we going to leave for our kids? What are you going to leave for yours? What am I going to leave for mine? Is it going to be a world uh, where basically, uh, if you want, and I'll use the word again, the technicality uh, is going to be able to get the crook off to prey on our kids? Or is it going to be something based on a more reasonable interpretation now, it's always these little tiny cutting edges where there are differences of opinion. But it's always the cutting edge where any kind of erosion of rights always starts. I don't think there's any great danger that our Constitution is going to be violently overthrown, uh, except possibly by some force outside the country. But I think there is a greater danger of it just being eroded away in non-existence without, by well-intentioned people, by people who believe that the primary thing is to get rid of drugs and to do whatever it takes to do it. A drug-free country, but a country which is not free of anything else except drugs. You know, a cop can speculate all day about the causes of crime and conditions and, and poverty and substandard housing and poor levels of, of education and things of that sort that, that might contribute to crime. But the cop's immediate task is to rid the street corner of the thugs who are making it unusable for, for law-abiding people. It's, it's much like order in a classroom. You've got to have order before you can have education. Well, you know, you've got to restore some order to the streets in order for normal people to go about their business. And that's, what, that's one of the things that STU2 was all about, was restoring street corners so that normal law-abiding citizens could use them. This successful business manager must sometimes leave home at night. When he does, he runs the gauntlet between the police and the drug dealers. I got arrested about a year ago for obstructing a public walkway. My house is right there. I pulled my van out, stopped my van in the middle of the sidewalk, got out to close my gate. They arrested me for obstructing a public walkway. And it just happened to be 11 o'clock at night. Didn't they arrest me? Yes, they did. I'm obstructing right. a public walkway. When the judge saw it, he says, case dismissed. But by that time, I had spent four hours in jail, lost half a day at work. And this was because I guess he didn't like the fact that I wear jewelry or something to figure out I'm a drug dealer, too. Everybody that lives here and is I not a drug we dealer. All get that. With them being showing a cell force, there's going to be some problems. But I would rather have the, the problems with, with the them. Bad because I know when I go to court, justice will come out, then have to tell somebody coming to buy drugs to get off my lawn, because they're going to have to fight him. Right. We make a lot of conflicting demands on the police. We demand that they take strong action against drug dealers and that they not abuse their power. A difficult balance to maintain in this violent and dangerous job. People say sometimes we must have law and order. We certainly must have law and order. But the law is in conflict with order. And the fact that the law is in conflict with order means that the police are pulled in two directions at the same time. At one point, they must keep order. But in order to keep order, they may feel that they have to violate the law. They mustn't do it. It's that conflict, that tension between law and order in our country that does create problems in our society. What do you have me for, sir? Could you turn around just for my safety and yours? Just turn around, please. What for? Your behind your head. Turn around, please. Oh, your man, please be and stuff. Spread your feet apart. Yeah. Wider. Point your toes out. They are. Now, what you doing? OK, let's just take a second. OK, Ron, why don't you stand up? Let's leave him on the ground. Of course, you're going to ask, why did you wind up with a body on the ground in handcuffs and ask you to explain, articulate those reasons? What, what do you think prompted the resistance on the part of the suspect? Well, when I was searching him, sir, I felt a hard object in his right front pocket. Hard object? Consistent with what? Shape of a what? Shape of a knife. Shape of a knife. So you think you got a knife in the pocket. Why don't you retrieve it, Ron, and we'll see what we got. Okay, sir. Okay. Examining what's in the pocket. Okay. What do we got, Ron? We have a marker, sir. Okay, what caliber is the magic marker? 
About a 38 caliber. Does the fact that you discovered this object make the detention, the use of the defensive tactic maneuver and everything legal, illegal, or what? I still feel justified in what I did, sir. And the justification is based upon the fact that the object you felt in the pocket was consistent with the shape, the feel, the size of a weapon, possible knife, things of that sort. Right. Under the rules we operate by, you know, that's all legal because you don't have to have certain knowledge. You have to have reasonable knowledge, and that's what the Constitution talks about. That's what the courts will talk about. Along with self-defense, recruits have to learn a lot of legal rules. For example, there are exceptions to needing a search warrant, like during the hot pursuit of a fleeing suspect. Uh, just as we pulled up, the guy that they brought, eventually brought out of the house uh, ran into the house and the law clearly states you can go in after him, which they just did, and just brought him right back out again. And where a person sees the police uh, and seeks to avoid the police by running into a house, uh, you can't do that. You can't use that as a, as a constitutional excuse uh, that I'm in a house, now I'm okay. With experience, clever dealers learn that lesson. They no longer come outside to sell. They run their operation from inside, using a runner to carry the money and drugs between the house and the buyer on the street. When the bus team arrives, all they find on the street is the go-between, with no marked buy money and no drugs. Meanwhile in back, some of the team have entered the apartment to look for the main dealer. They may not need a warrant if they have reason to believe that this evidence, the marked money and drugs, is about to be destroyed. It is legal to search the area within the arm's reach of the suspect. But if the police go beyond that, any additional narcotics they find cannot be used in court as evidence. Even if they suppress all that stuff, so what, okay? Uh, we still got the sales case on the suspect. We've taken, they're not gonna give the dope back to him. So he's out of the money for his dope. We've taken away part of his product. And so we've caused him grief. And that's, you know, tough shit. You know, we're causing him grief. The police reports must justify their entering the house, or else public defender Scott Spear is certain to challenge their actions. But when they get there, and there's nobody running, uh, and they just say, let's go into that house, and they don't get a warrant, then that's got to stop. They've got to stop going into those houses without a warrant. That's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. It's a violation of everybody's rights. Uh, if they're allowed to continue to do it, then uh, I don't see how it's any different from a society where the KGB does anything they want. Uh, why do I represent guilty people? Uh, why do I represent people whom I believe to be guilty? Because everybody's got a right to a fair trial. Everybody's got a right to due process in this country. And how else are we going to decide guilt? On the street, we have a system um, that is set up, which we believe in, to determine these things. And everyone has got a right to have the benefit of that system. Uh, so I, I can't decide He's guilty, so let's forget the system. Uh, if that were the decision that could be made, then we wouldn't need the system at all. At a suppression hearing, the system allows the accused the right to question the methods of the arresting officers. Scott Spear will try to get evidence he believes was seized in violation of his client's Fourth Amendment rights thrown out by a judge. This is the exclusionary rule in action. Did Officer Carranza in from what you saw, recover any physical evidence from his person? No. At that time, you did not know the name. An SDU-2 officer defends their new practice of entering a home without a warrant. In this case, they were not in hot pursuit, but they had another reason not to wait to get a warrant. The uh, controlled currency could be destroyed during that time, or it could be placed somewhere else. The person who actually made the sale could later say that it was someone who looked like himself but not him. The only person that's attacked in the courtroom is the officer. And uh, that's, they go after the officer every time he hits the witness stand, trying to get the officer crossed up, uh, find something wrong that the officer did, some little technicality that the officer screwed up. If the police have violated the law, they are going to be on trial for violating the law. 
and the Fourth Amendment is the law. The Constitution states that, uh, you know, you're protected from unreasonable searches and seizures. Unfortunately, when they wrote the Constitution, they didn't have indoor plumbing, and they didn't have uh, base rock that got flushed down indoor plumbing. And instead of a flint lock, we're looking at Uzis, okay? So now if they go to serve a search warrant on a house or something of this nature, or you're going to uh, make an entry, the judge and the law says that we're supposed to, like idiots, stand at the front door and knock, because these good people in here are going to come and open the door, and they're not going to destroy anything, you know? In reality, as soon as they see us coming up the front steps, they're running for the toilet to go flush the stuff. We're still bound by legal constraints to stand there and knock and wait an appropriate amount of time, uh, let them get rid of all the evidence, let them arm themselves if they so wish to do so, because we don't want to violate their rights for being dope dealers. I mean, it's bullshit. It really is. And what I'm suggesting to you, Scott, is that the situation has given a flow about as far as it can go. And now we're started back in the other direction, so that the vast majority of people in this country, the law-abiding citizens, are not held at bay by the criminals. When I talk about SDU-2 going into someone's house without a warrant, I'm not talking about some little technicality. I'm talking about the right of the people of the United States to be free and secure in their own homes unless the police have probable cause and a warrant. That's not some little technicality. That's just what the Fourth Amendment says. Officer Rogers, would you go up there and put an RR where you found my client? Be right here where these two lines are. I don't think a lot of times uh, sitting as we do in our little ivory tower up here become aware as we should have of the emotional involvement that that police officer working that beat has. He's right out there where the danger is occurring. Uh, we had uh, one officer, a uh, good police officer, uh, Ramon Irizarry, serving a search warrant a couple of years ago. A guy drives out front when the search warrant's over and starts shooting, and the officer gets killed in the presence of the other police officers. Those guys are living right on the edge of the danger zone, and it's hard to bring that emotion, the impact of what's happening on the street, into the courtroom. You don't get the emotional flavor of it in the, in the chambers. What we have here, Your Honor, is a warrantless, forcible entry to a home. The Fourth Amendment protects the home more than any other place. The Fourth Amendment also requires that the entry made in such an instance be justified if there is no warrant and if force is used by an emergency of an overriding magnitude. For those reasons, I wish to write a brief on these issues to show that the officer's conduct was unlawful. I think your points are uh, understood. And well, in this case, it was obvious that the police wanted to recover the $20 bill that was the evidence of the transaction. But just because that piece of evidence is in someone's home doesn't mean you can walk in or kick the door down. They can't say, well, gee, the evidence might suddenly disappear. That is not enough. There has to be some reasonable expectation that the evidence would disappear. And if we find that the evidence might be destroyed, then it would be OK for them to go in. I think as an example, the suppression hearing shows that the Constitution is alive and well on the streets. That's what it's all about, the protection and exercise of those rights. And while I was uh, thinking about my decision, both defendants were given uh, an offer, I guess, they felt they couldn't refuse. They ended up pleading guilty, and therefore, I don't have to make the decision, which is always a pleasure. Judge Byers never had to rule on the hearing because we took the case across the hall to Ken Kingsbury and dealt it. We made a plea bargain. And as long as the message gets across to the police that they've got to get a warrant in these situations, I've gotten what I want, which is compliance with the requirements of the Fourth Amendment on the part of the police. And if they do that, then I've won. The whole of what follows will depend upon the tough choice to be made by this man, Lewis Daniels. Will he plea bargain and thereby give up most of his constitutional rights? As he waits, his lawyer bargains with DA Ken Kingsbury and the judge for a reduced charge. They do so behind closed doors. Daniel's attorney, Don Clay, will now present the plea he has worked out with Ken Kingsbury to his client and explain the pros and cons. Daniels is accused of selling a $20 rock of cocaine. If he refuses to plead guilty and is convicted, he may get four years in state prison. If he takes the plea, he'll probably get probation. Three years of formal probation. 
also would be five months in the county jail. On five months on the county jail, that's 150 days approximately. You're talking about doing two-thirds of 150, which would be 100 days. Sometimes all, all that a guy can think of is, I'm going to get out of jail. That's, that's the paramount thing, and that's, you know, I'll sign anything to get out of jail. Further, as a condition of this probation, you'd be subject to a three-way search, that meaning your person, your vehicle, and your home, without a warrant. <coughs> you understand that? I mean, you're giving up your Fourth Amendment right, your right to uh, a freedom against unreasonable search and seizure. We'd give up your right we go to over it and over it and over it. Uh, some people understand it quite well. They know what they're letting themselves in for. Others don't. I'm convinced that other people are just looking at, I'm getting out of jail, and that's what counts. And uh, you will be giving up that self-incrimination right. Do you understand that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, we go back on the reverse side here. Now, as I go over this, I want you to initial. Once again, you got a right to a speedy and public trial by court or by jury. Can you initial that? By entering this guilty plea, you're waiving and giving up your rights to a trial by a jury and by the court. Waiving his constitutional right to a trial will save taxpayers about $30,000 in court costs. Over 90% of criminal cases are disposed of this way. You're hereby waiving those rights and you're giving up these rights in order to enter your plea of guilty. And you're entering this, this guilty plea, in fact, because you're guilty. And as your attorney, Mr. Clay, explains to you all the rights set forth on this form. Yes. Do you understand those rights? Yes. Other than what I've stated on the record, has anybody made any threats or promises to you to induce you to waive these rights? No. You also understand you have a right to confront the witnesses, that is to hear, see, and have myself cross-examine the witnesses that the people would call against you at the trial. Yeah. And by entering this plea today, you would be giving up that right. Yeah. And you give up that right. It's not like he's doing five months and walking away from it. He's doing five months as a condition of three years probation, and now we have the waiver of his constitutional rights as to the search clause of his residence, his person, his vehicle. So, and we have a probation department that is equipped to supervise him. Uh, we haven't lost Mr. Daniels. If you violate any of those terms and conditions of probation, I can, sitting without a jury, revoke your probation, and I could sentence you to prison from anywhere from three years to four years to five years. Do you understand that? Yes. One other thing you should understand, Mr. Daniels, if you plead no contest, you understand I'm going to find you guilty. you understand that? Yes. All right. As far as I've been, I've never been up here to Superior Court before, and it kind of mm, shake me up when he's telling me about the time if they find me convicted. Daniel's deal is only a bargain if he can stay out of trouble. Find a job, maybe, in this high unemployment area. Any infraction of the terms of his probation may land him in prison. Not reporting to a probation officer can result in this. Hit it. Probation! Open up! Probation search! Don't kick my door in. Hit it. Hey! Get your hands up! Get your hands up! Get up! Yes, you just stay right there. This man failed to report to his probation officer. There was also some information that he was dealing drugs. Though the search failed to find any, he was sent to jail for nine months. <laughs> Having to respect all the constitutional rights of the accused makes a lot of people impatient. They'd like to streamline the process and get the drug dealers off the streets. But if the system were more efficient, where would we put all those who are convicted? So what's the answer? Uh, putting everybody in jail is not the answer. Putting, uh, you're giving them time, so great. So we put them in jail for three or four months, and then uh, they, next time out, we get them again, and uh, they revoke their probation, and they send them to the state prison for 16 months, and the next time out, they'll do three years. Well. I mean, how many people can we put away? How many people can we stock into the jails? Politicians often campaign on a get tough law and order ticket, but are then unwilling to spend taxpayers' money on adequate prisons. And so the jails are overcrowded. But the Eighth Amendment demands that the people we put in jail be protected from cruel and unusual punishment, such as overcrowding. Federal courts become the only place prisoners can go to protect their rights. I'm typing a civil rights complaint. Violations of, among other things, the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. You've got 4,000 people in a place built for two. 
The ventilation system is plugged off. It doesn't work. Toilets on occasion back up. Well, I'm, I'm five foot six. I can tiptoe and touch the top of the ceiling. It's about four feet, four and a half feet wide, eight and a half feet long. If an inmate is using the bathroom, your head is a few feet away from him. If he's got emotional problems or gets a bad letter from home or whatever his circumstances are, you're right there coexisting with each other almost more intimately than a marriage without the sex, hopefully. Well, I can appreciate and understand the grief of the victims of the crimes of the people that were committed by the people in here, losses of their families. That's why they build prisons. That's society's way of dealing with people that they don't feel should be a part of it. But it's not a license for barbarism. Some people say the death penalty is the real barbarism and that no one has the right to take a life, not even the state. Just as society no longer tolerates torture or public flogging, someday it may reject the death penalty. For the time being, the Supreme Court has upheld it as neither cruel nor unusual. But can we ever decide exactly who deserves it and who doesn't? It's a sobering thought. We are one of the few countries in the industrialized world that still executes its criminals. That puts us in the company of countries like the Soviet Union and South Africa. The realities of this place are incredibly far removed from most of our daily lives. And yet you can tell quite a lot about a society by the way it treats the men it locks up in prisons like this. The Constitution is quite rightly at work in here, protecting the rights of these men just the way it is protecting people on the streets. Wouldn't you demand your rights if you were accused? Your constitutional rights are the only thing which stand between you and the unlimited power of the state. We are vulnerable in so many ways that no one could have imagined 200 years ago. In this high-tech age where information is power, government is using computers and other sophisticated techniques to reach for information about every aspect of our lives, even reaching into the body, the breath, the urine, the blood. Here in Boston there's an unusual irony. The police officers who test people's breath for alcohol deal with search and seizure issues every day. So they knew what was at stake when the police commissioner proposed to test their urine for drugs. Why should, just because I wear a badge and I'm a policeman, why should I uh, have my rights uh, taken away from me that they can just come up and take a shot at me just out of the blue? I mean, you know, it, it's not fair. And that's the reason we're all against it. The Patrolmen's Association challenged the commissioner's drug testing plan in federal court. They were quick to resist losing their right to privacy. So you're telling me that a Boston police officer has no rights under the Fourth Amendment? Not as they pertain to the job, no. It's your position that you can round up police officers for no reason or cause whatsoever, order them to submit to you urine, and if they fail to do so, you can fire them. That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm talking about you the, know, the gut issue. Frank McGee is the lawyer for the Boston Patrolman. Mike Powers for the police department. Both sides say they'll appeal the court's decision all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary. This is one of the important cases that could decide the legality of drug testing throughout the country. I have a hard time understanding how Commissioner Roach can get on the elevator of police headquarters every day where there is an indication or a sign that says we support the con and defend the Constitution of the United States, which includes the Fourth Amendment. It doesn't say accept cops. When a person's employed and, he, and while he's at work for the police department, we have a right to maintain for the public interest that they're beyond reproach, that they're free from drugs, and combating this menace that we're confronted with today in the United States in 1987. Guess who's in line? If you can do it to cops, 
then you go to firemen, then you do teachers, and go right down the line, and the next thing you know, you wake up one day, and the Fourth Amendment is gone. It's up in smoke. Police officers are engaged in public safety. I mean, we can deprive you of your liberty. We're the only agency in government that can use force. In one split second, a police officer can change your life dramatically, could probably kill you, use you know, deadly force, never mind excessive force. Uh, a decision in terms of arrest, a person who is not psychologically sound, a person who is under the influence of drugs does not make good decisions in my view. And I'm just very concerned about public safety. I, I think we're in a different category. We're still being told that we should stop and look at it. When these studies are saying 10% of the United States population has this type of problem, 23 million Americans, and we're told, let's stop and think about it. Some of the most major incursions into the constitutional rights of citizens have been carried out by well-intentioned people pursuing what they perceive to be well-intentioned goals. And therein lies the danger. Pe bad people don't go out and destroy the Constitution. Well-intentioned good people go out and destroy the Constitution. And you have to be always vigilant against that kind of thing. There is certainly no question in my own mind I am one of the lucky ones. I have never been accused of a crime in this country. And if I were, I certainly hope I would have my wits about me and insist on my constitutional rights. There are all sorts of circumstances in which the Constitution protects me, not the least of which is here in my own home. Like you, I am absolutely determined that the government is not going to invade my privacy. And yet, as we have seen in this hour, and we surely sense every day, there are all sorts of problems in the country, which many of us think are not being solved quickly enough. Drugs, for example, other kinds of crime, including white collar crime. And what do you think would ever happen if there were a major outburst of terrorism in this country? There are always people who, in a moment of crisis, tend to say, give the government more power to solve the problem. That is an instinct which the framers of the Constitution very much wanted us to guard against, because they knew that if government, police, for example, had more power, then it would surely come at the expense of our individual rights. If we really value our individual rights, we have got to guard them. Well, in just a moment, we'll be looking at another type of police power, using a hypothetical computer software theft as a point of uh, reference for a program called Sting, the controversy of FBI undercover operations. That's followed tonight at midnight by part five of the Masterpiece Theater presentation.